And in September of 2018, I got a call from Ronan Farrow at the New Yorker, and my life changed. He said, you, he said, you've been named in this letter alleging sexual misconduct involving you and Brett Kavanaugh. And I said, well, who's the accuser? He said, I can't tell you that. Hello and welcome to the Anne and Film Scoop. As you might have noticed, it's just the Film Scoop at the moment. Uh, Anne McElhinney is unwell. We have come back from Ireland and uh, apart from bad weather and lots of wokeism, the other thing we appear to have brought back from Ireland is a is a bug of some sort. Um, uh, not COVID, I might add. But uh, So Anne is unwell at the moment. We'll, she'll be back next week, hopefully. Um, so it's just me. Yes, just me. So New Year and what's on the, new, the first New Year show of the year? Um, yes, they partner with the state to bring down private citizens uh, because those citizens have the wrong political opinions. We hear, hear how the mainstream media are the new Stasi, the secret police. And we talked to one of their victims, one of the victims of the media Stasi, uh, who's not going to take it anymore and how he was brought into the... Uh, the madness of the Brett Kavanaugh nomination hearing, uh, and we talk, and and his life was basically destroyed because of that. Uh, but he's, you know, it's all for the greater good of the new Stasi. So we talked to that victim, and we've said it before, and we've said it again, and we will say it again. Uh, being an environmentalist means never having to say you're sorry, uh, even if you're wrong, 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 wrong again, 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 again. That doesn't mean that your current alarmist findings shouldn't be taken without a massive grain of organic salt. No, 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 no pinch of salt there. Uh, you know, it just, it, it just means uh, it just means that you are believed again and again and again, even though you're wrong again and again and again. The reason you're believed again and again and again is because your beliefs and your scientific findings match uh, leftists' um, narratives. So, oh, and talking of environmentalism, you know, might be able to hear the rain hitting the roof of the podcast room. Uh, it's done nothing but rain for the past few weeks here in Southern California. But don't be silly. Uh, it doesn't mean anything about climate change. The science proves it. Um, so we'll we'll examine that. So first of all, um, let's go over to the interview I did earlier with Mark Judge, who was a journalist, mostly private citizen, uh, until uh, the media decided to destroy his life to try and prevent the nomination of Supreme Court Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Let's go over here now and hear his harrowing story. So uh, I'm joined now by Mark Judge, uh, who until a few years ago was a journalist, but mostly a private citizen, uh, until he was mentioned as a participant slash witness, I believe, in a se in the sex alleged sexual assault by Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, then his life changed and he saw how the left-wing media worked hand in hand with political activists to destroy, to create narratives and destroy their political enemies. He, he you know, he compares them to the Stasi, the secret police uh, from the East Germany who, who worked with artists, who worked with the great and the good uh, to destroy their political enemies. He's written about it in this excellent book now that's just come out, The Devil's Triangle. Mark Judge versus the new American Stasi. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks. First of all, tell us who was Mark Judge and uh, who is Mark Judge now after the Brett Kavanaugh nomination hearing? Well, Mark Judge was a guy who grew up in Maryland, whose father worked for National Geographic and took him and his brothers and sisters to Ireland on several occasions, by the way, to learn about our history. Uh, uh, he was a uh, we're from County Mayo, but uh, and he was a journalist and uh, sometimes substitute teacher and a writer and someone who quit drinking in 1990. And, you know, distilled to his essence, I was doing some freelance writing and taking care of my elderly mother who had dementia. And in September of 2018, I got a call from Ronan Farrow at The New Yorker and my life changed. He said, huh. you, he said, you've been named in this letter alleging sexual misconduct involving you and Brett Kavanaugh. And I said, well, who's the accuser? He said, I can't tell you that. I said, well, where did this allegedly happen? He said, I can't tell you that. I said, when did this allegedly happen? He said, sometime in the 1980s. So after the hurricane that 
tore through my life yeah. four years yeah. later. I, I, well, I just want to, I just want to focus <laughs> on, on that. Actually, I suppose we, we, you know, you're a fairly private citizen and a journalist, a, you know, a, you know, a hero journalist, a, a, you know, a person, a celebrity journalist, Ronan Farrow phones up you and says, You've been named as a participant slash witness in a sexual assault, but I'm not going to, I can't tell you when it was. I can't tell you where it was. I can't even tell you the year, even the approximate year, but have you any comment on it? Yes. And a day or two later, a story broke in the Washington Post saying that this woman, Christine Blasey Ford, was accusing Brett of sexually assaulting her. And she said that I was in the room when it happened. So everything changed after that. And, and what what happened then? When you say everything changed, well, actually, let's go back to the to that phone call. Um, you're 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 saying in the book, uh, you know, Mark Judge versus the New American Stasi, that these phone calls were not as a result of journalists ferreting out a story or coming across a story. That these are coordinated attacks. On you know you were the you were used, being used to bring down Brett Kavanaugh in advance of his, his Supreme Court nomination, uh, or as 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 one of the lawyers for Christine Blasey Ford has put an asterisk to his nomination, um, um, I, and you're saying that the journalists work hand in hand with with these victims or with these uh, advocates, um, is that correct? It is correct, and I can explain how if you'd like me to. I, yeah, sure. The book, The Education of Brett Kavanaugh, which was written by two New York Times reporters uh, and published in 2019, reveals that in the summer of 2018, Christine Blasey Ford was working with a friend of hers, a guy named Keith Kogler. He's named in the book, and I just reproduced verbatim the quote from the New York Times book. And his job was to oppo me, was to find research about me, research my writing, my articles, my history – my family, my videos, everything. And um, this was during the entire summer. Um, the Politico magazine revealed that in March of 2018, Ronan Farrow was having dinner in New York with Michael Avenatti, the mm -hmm. now the now incarcerated fel felonious lawyer who uh, produced a client accusing me and Brett, Brett of gang rapes and drugging girls. So the Devil's Triangle is the oppo researchers, the politicians, and the media, and they do work together. It's not some big, scary, scandalous secret. I think it's common sense that they would work together, but they don't talk about it. I'm currently just looking at, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, off on a tangent, but it's, it's very, it sounds very similar. The Kevin Spacey, Kevin Spacey was accused of sexually assaulting Anthony Rapp, a, uh, an actor. And they had a trial, a trial, and Kevin Spacey had to leave acting, basically leave um, his 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 great jobs, all his great jobs. He was essentially persona non grata. But it, when when he was being sued, they got uh, discovery of the journalists' uh, text messages and um, the Anthony Rapp's uh, text messages. And uh, Anthony Rapp's one of the key parts of Anthony Rapp's story was that he met Kevin Spacey at the Tony Awards on a certain year, and he froze. And Spacey saw him freeze and realized, and there was this moment, et cetera, et cetera. It was a big dramatic part of the story. Um, except when the journalist researched it, there was no evidence that Kevin Spacey was ever at the Tonys that year. In fact, there was plenty of evidence that he wasn't. And they were worried that if they ran with this part of the story, that it would undermine all the rest of the story. So the journalist colluded with the victim to change the story. Uh, so that it couldn't be challenged rather than the journalist saying, hold on, you're saying this, this weakens your story. We need to report this as well and see what else is, you know, as you say, there's no, it used to be that journalists would research something. You say this in your book, research something, uh, kick, kick it to death, kick the, the story to death to, try, to, to see what's there, then approach uh, the 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 person who has been accused. Now they go straight to the person who was accused, and it's the same with the Russian with the Russia Gate file, uh, with the with the dossier. There were so many holes in that story that the smallest amount of journalism, uh, before publication would have shown that that the the, the, the Russia Gate uh, dossier was fake. But they didn't do it because they don't want to do it. 
Right. And they leave out exonerating witnesses. I mean, Emma yes. Brown at The Washington Post contacted me by email of, on September 16th and said, in a few hours, we're posting a story about Christine Bosey Ford. She says you were at this party and these other people were, were at this party where this happened. And one of the other people is a woman named Leland Kaiser. Uh-huh. And when the story was posted in the Washington Post, Leland Kaiser was not in the story. Mm-hmm. And as Kimberly Strass with the Wall Street Journal said, well, why did you leave Leland Kaiser, a girl who supposedly was at this party, out of this story? And it turned out that Leland Kaiser was debunked Bozzi Ford, said, I never met Brett Kavanaugh. This never happened. I don't know what she's talking about. So Emma Brown at the Washington Post actually left out an exonerating witness. Yes. I mean, it's it's Stasi. It's 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 beyond scandalous. It's Stasi tactics. So once yes. you realize that, you'll be better off because you know what's coming. Yeah. So that's it. They leave out exonerating witnesses. You're right. That that uh, um, which is, I mean, you sometimes you wonder why these people went into journalism because this is not journalism. Well, it's because they're activists. Whether they're out and out socialists or communists, that's probably part of it. But they're also people who have a lot of resentment and um, who have been polluted with identity politics and sort of academic jargon and and the culture of narcissism, which Christopher Lash talked about. And and it's all of those things put together. And their goal in life is to kill you, to destroy you. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, once you know, I mean, and I'll just quickly say before Brett, when Brett was nominated, I got a call from a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours in high school. And he was all excited. He said, this is going to be great. Brett's got a clean record. He's a great guy. He's brilliant. And I said to him, I hope you know what's coming. Because they're going to start with our birth certificates and go up to last week. And every time you had a beer, they're going to know about it. So, I mean, Brett did nothing wrong, but they are going to oppo us. So I sort of knew what was going on. First of all, let me ask, did anything like this happen at, at, at high school or at a party? Or do you remember Christine Blassie Ford? Do you remember this par- this alleged party? Tell me, tell me. What you what you what your rebuttal of this is? I don't remember her, and I don't remember any party like this. And like I said, I've been sober for thirty years. And when this happened, I said I'm happy to talk to her, and she can bring the FBI and her father and her family and anybody she wants because I have nothing to hide. You know, I've been in recovery a long time. I like to make things right, and I like to make amends to people. But hand to God and standing before Jesus, I just had no recollection of this. Um, I, I heard she uh, dated uh, one of our friends briefly, but that's all I, I knew about it. So to answer your question, I was ready, willing, and able to make things right if something had gone wrong. But I just – and I will go to my grave saying this. I just had no recollection of this. I really didn't and still don't. Um, so I think it was a big setup, but um, – but I also say that I don't know if something happened to her or not. Something might have with other people. Um, but they scrubbed her social media and her past and her Facebook and presented her almost like an infant, which apparently to people who grew up in this area who know her, she was definitely not an infant. So there's a lot working against me. But to answer your question, I don't remember her or this incident, but I was more than willing to you know, make it right if, if they could bring some evidence to me. How did it change your life? these accusations well i mean people tend to overly use the term post-traumatic stress you know someone called me a name i have ptsd and i don't like to play the victim thing like poor me but i actually had the real thing i mean it's it's gotten a lot better but it you know there was a great essay in the magazine first things called shame storm and it's about all the people that commit suicide when they're the brunt of something like this so it definitely affected me mentally although things are a lot better um, and you know, that's, that's really all I can say about that. I mean, things are better. Um, financially, I took a major hit there, you know, they did a GoFundMe for me, which saved me. I hope the book sells a lot. Um, you know, some conservatives also pitched in, but it just blows, uh, gouges a huge hole in your life. Um, especially if you have a conscience. I mean, I think I'm a pretty okay Catholic and I have a conscience. So I was agonizing about this for a long time. And then I started doing research and I thought, OK, this isn't quite what it appears, but it almost killed me. That's the short answer. I should I, su- I should I should add that the, the book is not is about the Kavanaugh trial, is about the Kavanaugh hearing. But it's also a look at the 80s uh, and the culture of the 80s, um, which I remember myself um, 
although you're I think you're a little bit older than me, so you probably had a more of a full eighties experience. Um, but um, tell us about why you want to include that and 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 the difference. Tell tell the youngsters out there the difference between the eighties and now uh, and why it was better. Well, I mean, it was a much freer time, a much wilder time. I think kids were treated much more like adults back then. As I say in the book, I was 10 or 12 years old when the movie The Bad News Bears came out in the late 1970s. And these depicted kids as drinking beer and cussing and smoking and really like little adults. And we were that generation. We were that age who became the teenagers of the 1980s. So you had a lot more autonomy, a lot more freedom. Um, the idea that you would censor somebody for their opinion or what they wrote would be offensive to most people, including liberals. Um, there was a kind of mysticism to the time too. I mean, when you went out clubbing and went out dancing or to see bands, you were completely disconnected from your normal quotidian life. I mean, you had no phone. You sort of got to enter this magical space where you got to rejuvenate yourself. And that contributed a lot to mental health. I think the music was incredible. Obviously, you too. You're Irish, so you know. Brett and I shared a love of you too, and um, I think people were just m- mentally much better off because they matured faster, they became autonomous faster, and they were tougher. I mean, you go online today, and it's you know people are having meltdowns over the most minor stuff. So it was basically a, a freer time and a funnier time, and you know it wasn't all. Great. I mean, there were some drawbacks. You don't want young teenagers getting into drugs and alcohol too early. And that was an issue. It came out of the Vietnam War. But you also don't want them to be, you know, uh, platitudinous Puritans who have no sense of humor. Yeah. yeah, you talk about the movies of the time and the common theme among them was that these were young people struggling to live in an adult world or, you know, their parents would go away for the week. And they would suddenly be a young adult or a young a child, a child, a teenager, suddenly within the adult world and struggling with the possibilities of the adult world. And but the joy of the possibilities of the adult world and the drawbacks. But there was no idea that these were that that was that was the theme of a lot of movies, wasn't it? A child coming into adulthood and and navigating that. Oh, a lot of them. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Risky Business, The Wildlife. You know, in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, it was filmed in a mall, and all these kids who were in it had jobs. They all had jobs. They were navigating sex and drugs and rock and roll. So, yes, a lot of the, and obviously, Risky Business was a guy who <laughs> entered uh, commerce, if I can put it that way. That correct. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was about kids wanting to be adults and, um, you know, kids, as I said, who were left alone by themselves a lot and got to party and have fun by themselves a lot. But yeah, that was a huge element of it. Like how do we be adults? And, you know, you didn't want kids to grow up too fast, which may have been the case in the seventies and eighties. But like I said before, you didn't want this blandness, like where's the great teen drama or comedy of 2022. Oh, they don't exist. I mean, there's no cultural, there's no drama now that's a cross cultural international teen drama that, uh, um, that compares to any of those in the eighties. No, not even. I can't think of one. I mean, um, and there was just a thing on social media the other day where they said that uh, kids are not working anymore. They don't have summer jobs. They're not sexually active or anything. So um, so you're saying kids don't have summer jobs anymore. They don't work after school. Is that because of regulation or what, what is it? I don't know. I think it might be that their parents might have more money than ours did and their parents can afford to support them because – You know, when I was at Georgetown Prep with Brett, it was, okay. it's May 20th. What's your summer job? My dad said, you know, you're going to see the Rolling Stones, which I think is great. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for your gas? You you couldn't be social without a summer job. And my only supposition is that the parents have to be giving them allowances. I mean, what else could it be? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And and it's it's sad because they get soft. I mean, you. You work a summer job at a supermarket or a lumberyard or something, it toughens you up a little bit, and you can go back to it. I had to go back to those kind of jobs after the Kavanaugh thing destroyed my life, and I went back to Home Depot. I worked in a French bakery because that muscle memory was there from when I was a kid. 
I mean, tell us about the role of Michael Avenatti in in all this, which has kind of been airbrushed uh, out of history now. Just remind us who Michael Avenatti was. Well, he's this lawyer who's in jail, and as Mark Penn, who's a Democratic strategist, wrote in the newspaper The Hill, who was paying him? Nobody knew who was paying this guy, and it was like the Russian dossier. He could just go out there and make any of these charges. It's emerged now that he's been a criminal his whole life. This was He didn't lose his way, as some people say. And he was getting paid handsomely as an opposition researcher for, I think, Hillary Clinton and the DNC. And, you know, his job was to oppo us and come up with the most salacious, insane nonsense imaginable, which he did. And, um, you know, I just saw something on Twitter where somebody said, I've known Michael Avenatti my whole life. He's been crooked from the day I met him. This isn't someone who went astray. So he started, you know, when all else failed, he came out with this woman who claimed that Brett and I had been at 10 parties where girls had been gang raped and drugged. And I literally burst out laughing when my lawyer called me and told me that I thought they've completely lost their minds. I mean, we live in a very tight knit Irish Catholic culture in D.C. If somebody yes. gets into an argument or throws up at a party, it ricochets all throughout the community. And there are 10 gang rapes and nobody's talking about it. So yeah. it was psychopathic. Um, but, you know, he was trained by A. Smith, who's the godfather of oppo research. So he's closely tied to the DNC. But real news organizations ran these allegations and interviewed Julie Swetnick. NBC the, the put her on the, the air. NBC, Kate Snow, put this on the air. And like I said, my father was a journalist at Life Magazine and National Geographic. He would have done a pre-air interview where he tried to vet this garbage and just said, this is absurd. We're not putting this on the air. Yeah, Because she had a history of, of, of making stuff up and fraud. Uh, isn't that correct? And then they also had evidence that disproved her story, but, but, but sat on it for three weeks. NBC was talking to somebody who they claimed, I think, was trying to verify her story. And the person said... That's not what I said at all. I wasn't verifying her story. I was saying the opposite. I was saying this is a bunch of garbage. And they sat on it. They sat on it for 10 days while Brett's nomination was still churning. So um, like I said, the Stasi, once you realize that, you don't get as yeah. upset because you know what you're dealing with. So t tell me about your comparison to the Stasi. I, mean, I tried to say it at the beginning, but but explain to me um, just you know how you how the how these journalists are, are this new Stasi. And what, what was the Stasi? The Stasi was the East German secret police, uh, as depicted in that great film, The Lives of Others. And apparently at one point it was half the population was spying on the other half. And they would spy on people. And if the people didn't conform to their idea of molding the new communist man, they would destroy them. They would humiliate them by revealing private secrets. They would blackmail them. And the reason why I didn't use the Nazi metaphor, which I think is overly used, is one, I think it's disrespectful to Jewish people. I think Comparing the left to Nazis is overly used. And two, as my research revealed, the Stasi worked with artists and writers and playwrights. Um, Hitler tended to dislike artists, especially modernism and jazz and mm -hmm. modern art. The Stasi were like, hey, we're going to work with artists and comedians and writers. And when you see something going from Anthony Fauci to Stephen Colbert's mouth, that's the Stasi. You know, and um, so they were actively involved in the arts and writing and all that other stuff. So to me, it seemed a much more apt metaphor than than the other one. Yeah. Um, and I think it's pretty exact because if you read some of their history, they were working with artists and writers and playwrights and and um, and to the point where a guy who won the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize in Germany publicly called them out and shamed them at his acceptance speech. He called them, if I can say this, you know, arseholes. And he said, you guys are a disgrace to the arts because you worked with these guys. Mm -hmm. And we have the equivalent of that here. You know, a quick example, the, the rock band Rage Against the Machine that used to be these great leftists. Yeah. Now they are the machine. The left now completely control the culture. And I, and I like the part in your book where you talk about the failures of the right. The right seem to think it's just enough to be against the culture. Uh, to rail against the culture, uh, but not create our own culture. Talk, talk about that. Well, you're an inspiration to me because you are a filmmaker and you've walked the walk, not just talked the talk. And, you know, a movie like 300 about the Spartans who resisted the invasion, 
Um, I once said to a conservative friend of mine, you know, this movie is worth more than 10,000 position papers yeah. from the Heritage Foundation because more people will see it and be inspired by it. And conservatives just don't put their sources near there. And if I can be so bold, I got a call from an actor who's acted with Johnny Depp and been in a lot of movies right after the whole Kavanaugh thing was over. I was in South Carolina. And he said, has anyone talked to you about making this into a movie? And I said, no. And he goes, you know what? This isn't a Holy Roller movie. It's not a come to Jesus movie, although that's part of it. You're Catholic. He said, you know, this is a psychological thriller, like at all the presidents, men or the lives of others. And it's absolutely scandalous that no conservative will will do this. Yeah. And he said, you know, $10 million, two nights on Netflix. That's what it would cost. And we have to start putting money into this and you know god bless ben shapiro and he's making movies but he tends to make the same movie over and over again which is damsel in distress out west caught by some psycho with a gun yeah. and you can't make that movie 10 times in a row you got to go deeper yeah and um and your movies are great i mean i, I think you did um, my son hunter i think was one of your movies i thought the actors were first rate in that the cinematography the direction yeah. i mean that was that was a that was a great movie, especially the actors. The actors were so good in that movie. Well, yeah, I think when we when we sat down to, to write the movie with, with Brian Godawa and then hire Robert as the director, I mean, the one thing we really wanted was not to make a conservative movie, actually, was it was to make a movie movie, to make something that yes. stood, stood side by side with, with, with movies that, that people would look at and not see it as a as a piece of conservative art, but as a piece of art. And that's, that's why we, we, we went there with the movie. It's not your grandmother's conservative movie. I can tell you that. No, it's not. And the problem I'm facing, which you'll totally empathize with is a high school friend of mine and I are working on a script and we've had people tell us, don't do a script. You guys will never sell a script. And one person said, well, you're trying to make an R rated conservative movie because the flashbacks to the eighties are going to be a little rambunctious. And when I saw My Son Hunter, I just yeah. thought, God, whoever made this movie would get this. Yeah, uh, My Son Hunter, it's not R rated, but um, but you can't tell you can't tell Hunter Biden's life story without cracking a few eggs, you know, um, uh, metaphorically. I mean, you know, the man he made the eighties look uh, tame, you know, um, <laughs> you know, he was an addict, he was addicted to drugs, he was addicted to prostitutes addicted to sex addicted to taking uh, nude selfies of himself addicted to filming himself having sex all that and so how do you present that because but he was also addicted to money and power and influence and addicted to, to giving that money power and influence to his parents and his uh, to his relatives so we wanted to show all of that so you have to you have to show the debauchery right but you made him a sympathetic character also the actor was so first rate in that movie you I don't yeah. know if feel sorry is strong enough, but you did kind of feel for this guy, like in <laughs> no, his no. dad's shadow. I mean, no. yeah. It's funny, you know, people watch it now on their laptops and that, but I, when we showed it in a theater, like a conservative woman came up to me afterwards and said, I was almost crying for him at one stage. Because when you yes. see it on the, on the big screen with the great sound and, and, and the color and all, it's just very, very, very moving. And that was another thing, uh, and I would urge you to, you know, to, to think about this when you're writing your script also, you know, look, don't, don't, don't create cardboard villains, right? Uh, yes. Because create human villains, because if, if someone's a cardboard villain, no one cares, right? A villain is supposed to be villainous, but if you have a ho human being who falls from grace, who falls, who, who, who through his flaws destroys himself, destroys everything around him or, you know, uh, then, then, you, then you people will care, right? It creates an air of suspense. But if they're evil from the word go and they twirl their mustaches, it's like no one cares. Yes, that's true. But although in my case, I think there was an element of the demonic at play here. And in the movie The Exorcist, the priests don't go into that room to negotiate. Now, I agree with you 100%. You have to don't treat them as cardboard characters. But there's almost a horror movie element to this because – as Tucker Carlson said, when Michael Avenatti walked into his studio, the hair on his arms stood up. Yes. So, but you don't want to overdo that or else you're in the horror genre, which this is not. Um, but there's a lot there for a movie. So it's, it's not far off a of horror. It's a cycle. It's a, it's a cycle drama. You know, uh, this it's, it's how you can be literally minding your own business and uh, to, to, for the greater good, you can become a victim. 
uh, of 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 the rush to morality, you know, but all for the greater good, which is which is the is the cry of 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 the Stasi everywhere. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, creating the new communist man, or as Fulton Sheen put it, you know, communism communism is about crawling back into the womb, and that's what they want to do. They want to crawl back into the womb because life is hard. Um, but yeah, we are working on the script and. It almost writes itself. You're at home minding your own business and this catastrophe hits you. This meteor hits your house. And then you alternate the, the story with flashbacks to the 80s. Yeah. Phenomenal soundtrack, some great funny scenes from there. You know, it, it unfolds pretty easily there. Yeah. Our job is just to get someone interested in yeah. doing it. Good luck because it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough path. So the book is Devil's Triangle, Mark Judge versus the New American Stasi. Um, available wherever you get your books you can buy it on amazon barnes and noble um what's been the response to it uh i mean uh fantastic so far the reviews have been great even people who are lukewarm about me or might have a little antipathy towards me and brett have said it's really well written they couldn't stop reading it which is my job as a journalist is to get to that point so and i did my homework i mean you read it i did my research yes. it's sourced i kept notes you know i call people out and and have the receipts. So yes. it's the response has been quite strong. Well, very good. So Mark Judge versus the New American Stasi. Get it. Uh, highly recommended by the Allen Film Scoop. Mark, thank you very much for coming on the show and hope to talk to you soon. Hope to talk to you uh, at the premiere of, of the movie. I hope so too. And thank you for making your movies. It's inspiring. Yeah, I have to say it's 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 harrowing. It's tough. I mean, this is this is where the world is now that they can just decide to destroy a single person's life uh, because, you know, to get at another person. And the, you know, that, I mean, I read the book and, you know, I read the book and it's, there's a sadness to the book because when you think about the 80s and we talked about that, the idea of adults or children negotiating an adult world, it's a great idea. It's It's true. Uh, and then you come to Kevin McCarthy's speakership nomination. You have the likes of conservative Republicans, Matt Gates, you know, negotiating not in an adult world, but negotiating for uh, for whatever bauble he gets from Kevin McCarthy. Um, it's it's sad uh, to see the way the world has come uh, from the eighties to now, and uh, maybe we should, you know, maybe we should have an eighties revival. Uh, and bring back Ronald Reagan. I don't know, uh, but you know when you see Ronald Reagan and you see Kevin McCarthy and Matt Gates, there might be a reason why Republicans lose elections. So, um, Paul Ehrlich, we've talked about Paul Ehrlich before. We've actually featured him in some of our documentaries. You know, he, he's been wrong and wrong and wrong about everything. This is him in the nineteen seventies. And uh, in, in, this is him in nineteen seventy. He wrote a book called "The Population Bomb," warning of, of the dangers of overpopulation. Uh, the oceans will be d dead uh, within one decade. America will be subject to water rationing by 1974 and food rationing by 1980. How wrong could you be? I mean, we now have an obesity crisis in America. Uh, and here is Paul Ehrlich, uh, a Stanford professor who said there's going to be food rationing by 1980. Um, he said that that the government should fine people who have large families because of the population bomb. And you know what the Ehrlich's defence against these criticisms is now? You know what? You know he tweeted this. I'm gonna. This is exactly what he tweeted, and so it shows you what's so wrong with science nowadays and the media. Sixty Minutes Extinction Story has brought the usual right wing out in force. If I'm always wrong, so is science. Since my work is always peer-reviewed, including the population bomb, and I've got virtually every scientific honour. Sure, I've made some mistakes, but no basic ones. So you can be completely wrong again and again and again, provably wrong, demonstrably wrong. But as he says, it was peer-reviewed and he's been given every scientific honour. So therefore, his credibility remains. It's the complete inversion of science. And it's the complete, it shows you the lack of credibility of the peer review process. Funny, a lot of conservatives have population worries, issues. Maybe we'll do a program on that one day. But let me tell you, the big problem now is lack of population, not too much population. There aren't enough children in the world. China's going to get old before it's got rich. Japan is getting old and is going to lose its riches. And uh, there's, you know, America is one of the few countries that where the population is increasing 
uh, to, to match the retirees, but that is going to end soon. Every Western Europe, uh, Spain, Germany, France, all of these countries, they're not having children to replace the adults. Uh, and so there's going to be a massive population shrinkage. And if you think it's difficult dealing with a increase in population in an area, just try and deal with a decrease in population in an area. Schools close, shops close, doctors leave, uh, infrastructure crumbles because there's no tax base to pay for it. But that that is almost a sideshow. You would think that anyone who predicted the problems with the population and got it so completely wrong wouldn't wouldn't be uh, invited back into polite society. No, no, Paul Ehrlich, because his find, his scientific findings always match the leftist narrative, has won a MacArthur Genius Grant. He's won prize after prize. And then a few weeks ago, he was on 60 Minutes uh, warning of mass extinction uh, of, of a species uh, because of man's exploitation of the planet. It's sort of a, a twist on its old story that was proven wrong then is wrong now. And 60 Minutes gave him an uninterrupted uh, canvas to paint this doom and gloom. And they had not one witness or one scientist to say this is nonsense. I mean, and it was Scott Pelly of, of, of 60 Minutes. Look, 60 Minutes is is a joke news program. It has no credibility. Interestingly, Scott Pelley, and we'll put that up now, Scott Pelley also interviewed Stephen Donziger uh, about how Chevron was polluting the rainforest uh, in Ecuador and uh, how th they were refusing to clean it up and how he was going to sue on behalf of the poor natives, etc., etc., etc. Turns out Donziger uh, committed fraud and, uh, wasn't interested in cleaning up, was interested in getting a billion dollars and ha pushing a leftist narrative against a multinational oil company. He was convicted of RICO fraud in a civil court in New York. Uh, he His emails showed him railing against government attempts to clean up the rainforest because it was going to show the government were responsible for any damage and it was going to show that it was a much cheaper to clean up the damage than he was claiming. It's all about the money for him. It was all about the narrative for him. Uh, and Scott Pelley gave him a canvas again to paint that narrative. 60 Minutes has no credibility. Scott Pelley has no credibility. Talking of environmentalism, rain, rain, go to Spain. Uh, only it's come to Southern California now. Um, and partly before the rain came, we had a 1,200-year a drought that had not been seen for 1,200 years. Uh, I'm old enough to have lived through two droughts in Southern California. Um, when we first came here around 2010, there was a drought then. And I remember it well. It was years, no rain. Well, the first year we were here, there was, a bit of, there was rain. Then no rain, no rain, no rain. Bits of rain, no rain, no rain, no rain. Unprecedented drought. We're going to have to cut water consumption by 20%. We did. We took it seriously. Everyone, we ended up cutting water consumption in Los Angeles by 25%. What did the government do then? They jacked up the rates by 25%. But they didn't cut their costs uh, by 25%, like an ordinary business when you lose 25% of your income. No, they said, oh, we've lost 25% of our income because we asked for it, because people are now conserving water. So they jacked up their rates 25%. They also used... The old, the, the new water usage rate as as the baseline, so that they could charge you more everything you went above it. So they punished you uh, for saving water. Then, then I remember reading all these articles in the Los Angeles Times. We'll try and find them for you, where they would ask a question. Oh yeah, the rain came. The rain came for a year or two, and they said, "Does this mean that the drought is over?" And you know what the answer was. No, it doesn't, because we don't have an actual definition of drought. So now when you, that's what they said. There's no actual scientific definition of drought. I thought a drought would be, you know, four years of below 50% below the average rainfall for each year or 10, you know, two years of below some kind of scientific measurement that you would say we are now officially in drought. No, it's just a made up term that scientists ascribe to a weather pattern without any statistics to back it up. So we asked, so the question is now, like, don't believe anything they're telling you about a drought. 
it, a drought is not a scientific term. A drought is a media term. A drought is a dramatic term. Uh, and when the rain, this rain falls and fills the reservoirs, they will tell you probably there's still a drought or they will just stop talking about a drought until the next spell of good weather and suddenly we'll be back in drought again. They change the story. They change the terminology to fit the facts, not the other way around. Don't believe them. That's the end of the podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Come back next week. We'll, we should have some big announcement for you then that we're going to have today, but it's not possible. It's very dramatic. It's very interesting. And it'll, and it'll cause a little bit of controversy. So tune in next week to the Alan Phelan Scoop. Thank you and bye. Hey.